Hi everyone, this is Alex from Nier, and with me today is Ben Jones from Plasma Group. Hey guys. And we will talk today about Plasma cash flow, the new flavor of Plasma, and we will go into a lot of technical details. And Ben, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, give us a quick overview? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So I'm Ben, um, I'm a part of Plasma Group, which is an open source um, community-driven Plasma implementation. Um, so we're going to talk about something today that's been called cash flow. Um, we kind of consider it just a Plasma cash variant. Um, and it's our specification implementation. Um, so particularly the thing that we're going to talk about is we're going to assume that you have a bit of knowledge about Plasma Cache, and we're going to talk about the, like, the key difference in this particular variant that we've implemented. Um, and basically what it comes down to is an attempt to solve the fixed coin denomination problem. So like if you remember in, you know, maybe in, in, in the Plasma Cache world, you have these unique coins, which have a unique coin ID, right? And of course, these are the things in the bottom of the Merkle tree. Uh, in the block structure. And if you want to send um, a coin at this particular you know, spot in the Merkle tree, you, know, you can send a coin so it's you know, like a new color, new owner, whatever. OK. So that's really, really cool. And it, it's great because Plasma Cache solves like, a lot of problems by doing this over like, what's called like, Plasma MVP, which was the state of the art before. Um, so like, the main thing that it solves is like, no mass exits. OK? Um, so very, very briefly, like why that's important. This is just important like with Plasma Cache generally, um, is in earlier versions of Plasma, because coins weren't defined with this sort of non-fungible ID, what ended up happening was the operator could like create a UTXO sort of like out of nowhere, right? It's just like a, like a magic poof of a UTXO. And then they could try to exit that. And this was really, really bad because in Plasma Cache, when you exit, you're specifying this coin. But before, you weren't really specifying anything. You were just sort of specifying this poof of a previous input. And so because of that, if anyone saw this occur within the next whatever challenge period, we'll call it a week, week everyone had to get out. OK, so Plasma Cache was great because by making all these coins non-fungible, you can fix that problem by making exits be on coins, not on these sort of poofy UTXOs. So they're actually really not UTXOs in the Plasma Cache model. Um, there's just like coin transfers, okay? Great. So that was really, really good. Really, really good thing that Plasma Cache introduced. Kind of bad thing that it introduced was these coins have to be a fixed size, right? They're like these discrete, non-fungible things. Um, they, they don't have to be equal to each other, right? It's just that you, have, you cannot split them after you move them. Absolutely right. So in, in theory, these can have different denominations, and I believe there are some Plasma Cache implementations that do have different denominations. Um, However, for example, in our, in our implementation, um, we do still have a notion of these coins. Um, however, um, they're all fixed denomination because we solve this sort of changing denomination thing a different way. OK, so what is it that we actually do to change that? It's a pretty simple change. It just requires like, like thinking about it very carefully to make sure that it's still secure in the context of the exit game. But it's a very simple concept. The concept is simply that we treat transactions over ranges of coins instead of particular coins. So now, um, here, now, instead of sending just one coin, I define a transaction on a range of coins. Okay, and this is one transaction, just one single transaction. And with this transaction, we may update all of these coins simultaneously. But how do you ensure that your coins are in a contiguous range? Ah, so that's a very good question, and we'll hopefully get into that later. Uh, the essence of it is, is you have to do that separately, and that's going to involve basically atomic swaps. Mm -hmm. We've explored a few ways to do it. It seems like the best is probably voluntary atomic swaps. Um, in essence, like the idea is that if you have some coins here and some coins up here, um, and someone has some coins here and some coins here, it's advantageous for both of you to align all of those coins because you can treat them in one exit. Right. OK, so that's the, that's the sort of basic transaction format, is just you want to do transactions over ranges of coins. OK, so what does that mean? There's a lot of, in, in previous discussions on plasma, plasma cash flow, um, some people have definitely talked about this as being like coin splitting or coin merging. Um, I want to sort of try to break down that idea with this, with, with this video. It's really not about coin splitting or coin merging. It's about the coins being very, 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 very small. So maybe a three coin uh, transfer is a very bad transfer example in this case. In reality, in our implementation, we have 16 bytes worth of coins. 
And so that's literally like, you know, bajillions, whatever, you know, exactly one bajillion possible coins. And you might transfer like thousands of coins. So you can, so basically the way to really imagine it is like coins on a number line, right? So that's literally how we treat these transactions. So we say like, you know, a transaction might be on the range 100, 200, right? And what that means is there's, you know, like a zero here and then out here is 100 and then out here is 200. So you can send all of these coins, right? in just one go. And that is the really important property that we have. So it's gonna be even probably in practice way more than 100. It's gonna be like, you know, you could do a million. There's really no reason not to. Yeah. And so now when I send, I need to send the proofs uh, of like inclusion or whatever they called in plasma, Correct. right? For each of those 200, 100 Correct. coins, right? Correct. Yes. So this, the, the, so what you're getting at is like going to be probably end up being the meat and potatoes of this video. Um, because what it turns out to be, what turns out to be the case, is that it's very tricky to define a transaction format in this way uh, that does, still allows you to have light clients. Okay, so maybe we'll like erase this and like go over a little bit on how um, light clients work in Plasma Cache. So along with mass exits, yeah, maybe we'll just write it here first. Like light light proofs, we call them light proofs. Light proofs are a really, really, really important thing that you can get. Okay, so um, what does this mean? This means that to ensure that your particular coins are safe, instead of downloading an entire block, you may download just one branch uh, in the block, one branch in this Merkle tree. And that allows you to have clients, which like, like we have, like if you go to burner.plasma.group, you can do full verification, and it's like a full, new, full node on these light proofs um, on your phone. And that's because they only have to download one branch. So even if you have the operator running this massive like AWS instance that's like a bajillion transactions per second, you can verify just one in about the same height. And so it's just one single inclusion. And you're downloading it still for every block, right? Absolutely. You are downloading it for every block. You absolutely must do that. Yeah. Okay. So light proofs were the other big thing that we do. Maybe we'll erase this and talk about what those light proofs look like in Plasma Cache and why they work. Um, and that will sort of inform why the range-based version is a little tricky. Okay. Um, so I love my Merkle trees right aligned. I don't know uh, how the, the other viewers feel about this, but I think this is just like the best way to draw Merkle trees. I'm a big fan, as I say, messing it up. <laughs> okay, um, so this is like we can think of as the block structure in Plasma Cache. So we're just going to review how Plasma Cache works. So at each of these things are these non-fungible coins, right? So we have like z zero, one, two, blah, 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 right? So... In normal Plasma Cache, the way that you do a transaction on, say, coin two, right? If we want to turn that into like a colored in square, right? The way that you do that is in the height block at height n, whatever, in this block, you must get like the inclusion proof for two, right? That is like, you know, Alice sending to Bob, let's say, right? Okay, so at this exact trace, right, along the Merkle branch, right, you must get, um, a transaction, right? And of course, if there's no transaction here, then you know things that haven't been computed, right? So very simply, like that is the, the light proof structure. And the whole point is that because a transaction on coin two is only valid in index two, uh, then you don't care about any of the rest of the structure. This whole subtree you can ignore, right? This, this part you can ignore. You don't need the whole thing. So of course, one note in Merkle inclusion proofs, right? You need like the siblings of each um, yeah. node, right? So in reality, it's going to be like, um, you know, this guy and a guy here and a guy here, right? Corresponding to this guy mm -hmm. and this guy and this guy, right? Um, yeah, and that's how, you, that's how you do it up. But effectively, you can think of it as just like this branch, right? That's how I like to think about it. Okay, does that make sense? That's plasma, that's plasma cache. Okay, cool. Okay, so that's wonderful. We don't have to download any of this stuff. It doesn't matter at all. Now, here's where the problem comes in. The question that you have to ask yourself is what branch, what index, what leaf index in the Merkle tree does a range go in, right? Because we don't want it to go in every coin that's in the range, right? So for example, if we had a transaction, let's say we want to do a transaction over coins two, three, and four, right? We want to have just one inclusion proof for that. If we had one at coin two and at coin three and at coin four, that might as well just be a transaction of coin two, three, and four. So we need some way to describe ranges. So we need something right, that looks like something like this branch, right, that says, okay, actually, it's the range two through four, right? That's what we want to do. But also, quick question. Yeah. So if, if, if uh, in Plasma cash flow, mm -hmm. if someone sent me a range from 100 to 200, 
And let's say I already possessed previously the range from 50 uh, to 100. Yep. Can I send later uh, 50 to uh, 110? You absolutely may. Yes. Awesome. It is a quite wonderful property of the system. And so this is something interesting. This is why I mentioned before we don't have UTXOs. Mm -hmm. Sort of all of the logic here like, is not referencing previous transactions. It's all pretty much implicit. So like, it's implicit that like, a, like a, a transaction on a particular range is spending the transaction that was like the last transaction in that particular coin. So that, that's like the most recent one, then some non-inclusion proofs, mm -hmm. and then the new one. Mm -hmm. Right, and so it's like implicit that that's referencing that. Right. So because of that, if you receive this transaction and you receive this transaction, you may spend that immediately. But before before we go into how it is actually implemented, sure. there, there's some fundamental limit, as it feels to me. Imagine that I uh, received over the course of time one billion consecutive tokens, but each of them was an individual transaction. Yes. You're saying you have some magic way for me to send all billion of them in a single transaction, so that the light client will be convinced that I'm not tricking them without them loading 1 billion proofs. Ah, very good. So absolutely, you can send in one transaction, though absolutely the light client may, must check the 1 billion coin sent in the past. That Unfortunate. is definitely true. <laughs> Unfortunate. OK, so if you want to get to that point, like let's snark it, <laughs> right? That's that's like really that's the answer right. to all the problems. Right, exactly. But notably, like this is like the the um, right. So maybe one thing to note is that it it the it is important that this is not a history. Um, it doesn't intertwine histories of coins. So one interesting property that we'll see later, perhaps, is for instance, if if um, the range fifty to one hundred and fifty is transacted, transacted, right. And then um, at like you know at, at like n, and then at like block n plus one, right? We see um, like 100, 100 to um, two hundred transacted, right? Mm -hmm. If I and then like then then let's say like I eventually receive um, coins like one hundred through one fifty. Okay, I do not need to know whether or not the the owner in this transaction owned coins fifty to one hundred. And I do not need to know whether the, 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 the person transacting coins 100 to 200 owned coins 150 to 100. So this section, because I'm not receiving it, this section I don't care about. And this section I don't care about. Right. So, how, so the, like, the real worry with that, so sure your like, 1 billion coins thing is a problem. The really bad thing would be if this could sort of like fan out and end up like everyone downloads the full history. Mm -hmm. So we do at least have this property maintained, that you only care about the transactions and the owners on the particular range of the transactions that you care about. Yeah. So very interestingly, right, like it, it could be that this transaction is like both valid and invalid at the same time. But the, the, the part that you care about is valid. The part that you care about is valid, so you don't care. So you, re, you literally, like literally the, the, the 150 to 200 here could be completely wrong, doesn't affect your safety. So, so effectively, if, the trans, if there's a transaction which sends tokens from 100 to 200, yep. the validity property is per each individual Token. It's per token. And the way that that is manifested in practice um, is that the challenges that you perform are on a particular coin ID. Mm -hmm. They are not on like a range. range. So when you, like, when you like submit a challenge on an exit, an exit is over a range, and you say, I'm challenging that exit, but I only have to specify one invalid coin in that exit to invalidate the whole thing. And so I just specify the one, and it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, cool. Let's see how it's done. Cool. OK, great. Um, so we kind of got to it before. I don't, I, you know, I, I think maybe we'll go to a better example than coins two through four because that's kind of a small range. And like in practice, what we want here is like is like much larger things. So let's do that. Okay. So basically, the problem that we're going to outline here is like is is effectively a double spend um, problem. This is effectively the like naive attack on this range based solution. Okay. So let's see what that means. Okay. I'm just going to do like a, a height. Well. Yeah, let's just let's just do a, a you know height two tree. Okay, so let's say right here we have a transaction on um, 100, 200, and by the notation that we usually use, this is like inclusive and exclusive, but whatever. Okay, okay. So let's say that we have a transaction here on on range 100 through 200. Okay, that's great. That's what we want. However, any time that I receive a transaction. I must be ensured not only that I am receiving a transaction, but also that there is not a double spend included at the same height. Okay, so here's the problem: What if in this block structure, like 
let's say I just download this, right? So I see this, so I see this thing, and I see this thing, but I don't see these guys, right? That this is the whole struct. Oh, oh you're saying like this leaf corresponds to the entire range? So let's say that this leaf is, is the transaction on this range, yep. We want the property, so maybe, maybe one thing to note there. One of, the, one of the huge advantages that this scheme gives you over, um, over like the, the simpler plasma cache, right? It is a plasma cache variant, but one of the huge improvements is that the height of the tree is not determined by the number of coins. So this is very interesting. So before in Plasma Cache, like the height of the, there was a max height of the tree defined, right, in, in Plasma Cache. And that defined, but for based on that height, that fanning out of these Merkle trees, defined the total number of possible coins. In this version, there's unlimited deposits, and the height, the, the thing in every single one of these slots is simply one transaction. Right, very critically, just one. So what that means is that the height of the tree is not the log of the number of coins, it's the logarithm of the number of transactions, which is a really nice property. So to get that, we need one transaction per leaf. Okay, that doesn't sound like it will work yet. <laughs> it doesn't, it's, yes, it's very, it's very, very tricky. You're totally right. Right, so what is the problem? So obviously the attack here is if I download this branch, right, basically what I get is I get this thing, I get this guy, and I get this guy, right? And I use that to compute the root and verify it against the root on the Ethereum main chain. Okay, so what's the problem? The problem is that I haven't downloaded these guys, right? So it's a really, really problematic thing because what if right here there was also, you know, 100, 200, right? And this was like, you know, A to B, and this was, you know, A to C. And, and I presume transactions are sorted in some way at the... Ah, so the solution that we will impose will like be um, sorting. Will will end up being sorted. Absolutely. Um, however, like it's one thing to note here that you don't like you could theoretically implement this stuff without doing any sorting and without any of this stuff, mm -hmm. and you just would lose light client support, um, which is very interesting because you remember that before we wrote the um, the mass exit, the mass exit problem as being one of the problems with older versions of um, Plasma, where mm -hmm. if 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 an invalid exit began, everyone else had to get out. Yeah. Um, those, th those older versions also didn't have light clients, like Plasma Cache sort of like found both the mass exit solution mm -hmm. and light clients in one go. If we do this range thing, interestingly, we can actually get rid of mass exits, but not have support for light clients. So if you just were required to download all of these leaves and make sure that there wasn't a 100, 200 transaction mm -hmm. there, that would, be, um, that would actually still be better because it would solve the mass exit problem. But it's not ideal because we really, really like the idea of light clients. So what's the beautiful solution? Okay. So the beautiful solution is that we need some way for just the information in this branch. We need a way for just that information to be sufficient to prove to the light client that no other such valid transaction on the same range, on an intersecting range, or intersecting, yeah. in an intersecting range, exactly right, exists over here, right? Mm -hmm. And so effectively, what we're going to do is we're going to do like a, like, like a branch validity condition, right? So we already had one of these in vanilla plasma cache, okay? The branch validity condition is very, very, very simple. For a transaction on range three, for a transaction of coin three, the valid branch is branch three, right? That was a very, very, very simple validity condition, and that's the basis for light crime proofs. So all we need to do is do a branch validity condition for ranges, right? That's what we need to figure out, right? And like that really ends up being like the key problem that you have to solve with this, okay? So does that make sense, questions? Uh, well, let, let's see how, the, how okay. the branch validity works. Okay, great, okay. So the trick is we no longer are doing a simple Merkle tree. Okay, so there's actually, so interestingly enough, um, shout out to Dan Robinson, who came up with an incredibly beautiful, even more elegant solution to this than we previously had. Um, so in like lots of ETH research posts and stuff, there's been a more contrived answer um, called the Merkle sum tree. Okay, um, what we're going to go over today is something that actually has, I don't think has been written up to date, um, but it is a Merkle index tree. And it's a little more intuitive way to think about it. Um, Actually, a lot, a, lot, a lot more intuitive way. It's like, it's very, very beautiful. Shout out to Dan, he's amazing. Okay, um, but the basic idea in all of this is that a Merkle tree just ain't gonna cut it. We need to add something into the Merkle tree, something extra that's gonna allow us to prevent this. Now you might consider like separate, uh, an entirely separate data structure that the validity condition also references both of these data structures and does it that way. Um, I haven't really explored thoughts there, but you might even imagine that, you know, you could do some, RSA accumulator magic, all the fun plasma memes, right? 
Um, but the best one would be to just embed it in the block structure itself. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. Okay, so like, what does that mean in practice? Like, to, like, to define like an arbitrary binary tree, right? Like, what, like, like the way that you define that is simply like the parent function, right? Of left and right, right? So this is the left sibling and the right sibling. Whoops, I'm saying sibling. Right, right. Um, so in a Merkle tree, right? A Merkle tree is a binary tree where parent equals hash, right? Very, 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 very simple. Okay. So we are going to make so that so that's like Merkle, right? Like this is like vanilla Merkle, right? What we are going to define is something called a Merkle index tree. Okay. Um, so maybe one other thing to note here is that we would have to define like what are the what is the set that left and right belong to as well, right? Like in a sort of math sense. Um, so like in practice, we would also have to say that the left and right are the 32-byte hashes that the parent resolves to. Okay. So now we're going to define a new parent function, and we're going to define new data elements for the left and right. So before, maybe, maybe I'll just maybe I'll just like continue the like the, the vanilla Merkle tree thing here, right? And maybe we'll say vanilla. So this vanilla Merkle tree has a parent that's just a hash function, right? Um, and the elements, right? Like the the nodes, we'll call them the nodes, right? Like every one of these things, right, is a node in the Merkle tree. So the nodes are bytes, thirty-two hashes. Okay, very, very simple. Most hash functions return to 32 bytes. Um, so the hash function, like the only thing that we need is that the parent indeed resolves to a node. So it requires that the hash function resolve to 32 byte hashes. And then we have the effect that we want that, you know, we can build a whole binary recursive beautiful thing with this data structure. Okay, so now we've got to update the nodes and we've got to update the parent. Okay, great. So let's do this. We're going to call this index, index Merkle sum tree. Okay, and so as a spoiler alert, like the reason that we're going to call this index is because it's going to refer to the index of some coins. So it's actually going to refer to some coins as we go up the tree. And maybe that'll begin to start making you think about what this actually does. So very simply, um, a, now a node equal, is a tuple. It is a bytes32 hash. And uh, it is a coin ID. So now every node in the Merkle tree has a coin ID. Absolutely. And so, so you know, be careful when we say has a coin ID, right? Like it, it references a coin ID. It's not that it has it in mm -hmm. like an ownership sense, right? Of course. Um, but it does indeed point to a coin ID. That, that's one of the, like it would be like 173, for example. It's not a range. Exactly. It's not a range. It's just one. Exactly. Um, and so, and so um, yep, it's bytes to a coin ID. And similarly, the parent, just the only thing to note on the parent is that the parent um, equals hash, the parent function is the hash of, of, of the nodes, so like left and right. Note that this includes the coin IDs. The coin IDs as well, right? So you're committing both to this hash and this hash. So like in practice, what you do is you take the left bytes 32, concatenate the left coin ID, concatenate the right bytes 32, concatenate the right coin right. ID, right? And so that's how we're gonna express with that. And then believe it or not, it's simply the left left coin ID. Coin ID. Mm -hmm. This is why it's a, it's a much more beautiful. Um, this part is very, very beautiful. Before we were doing an addition of the coin IDs effectively, and it was very, very messy. This is a lot cleaner, yep. So that says left.coinID there. So that's gonna be the property. So believe it or not, that's gonna give us backlight clients. Super cool, super cool. Okay. Um, let's, let's see how it works. Yeah, let's do, an, let's do an example, okay. So I'll clear this off here. Great, great, okay, um, okay. So, and the other, the other thing that we're going to have to do, obviously, is define an validity, a validity condition. Mm -hmm. But maybe it makes sense for me to just do an example one of these, yeah. perhaps. Yeah, let's do an example. Yeah, yeah, let's do an example. Okay. So I'm going to start with the leaves, because that seems smart. So let's say we have... Um, oh, but also, do, do we need to know by now what is the sorting? What is the ordering of the ranges of the transactions? Ah, very, very interesting question. So interestingly, um, the validity condition uh, will enforce a sorting. Mm -hmm. So namely, the property that we must have is that as you go up the tree, the coin IDs for the things that are being merged in from higher and higher up must be greater than the previous step down. So as you work your way back up the Merkle tree, mm -hmm. the, the coin IDs that you're pushing in must be to the right of the coin IDs on the left. And they mm -hmm. must be like increasingly to right. the right. right. And that's so going to end up being the property. Obviously, the leaf coin ID is just the coin ID, right? 
Oh wait, there's no coin ideas ah, transactions. Ah, 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 yes, coins. exactly. So we're gonna, one thing that we're going to need to figure, figure out how to do is what we call like parsing the the the, the, the transactions into the bottom nodes, mm -hmm. right? Like turning the leaves into the bottom level of the tree, um, and it's and it's and it's and it's actually going to end up being the um, Effectively, the left of the the left of the range is what it's going to be as well. We had a much more complex thing where you had to subtract stuff. Oh, coin ID, so beautiful, so beautiful. All right, so example. Um, okay, so let's say maybe zero ten. Um, let's say um, ten fifty. Let's say um, uh, you know whatever fifty hundred, and then let's say like hundred. Um, 500. Okay, let's go with that. And maybe I didn't make myself enough room here, so we'll erase the very simple Merkle tree here. Okay, so we're just going to do four. We'll just do four for now, okay? It's maybe, hopefully it won't be too degenerate. We might want to add more, but... And so that's, an, that's a valid example where there's no intersections. This is. Yeah. Yes, so this is a valid example where there's no intersections. Um, and what, what we're going to do later, like, spoiler alert, we're going to try to change one of these to an overlapping range, and we're going to show why that breaks the validity condition. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we'll end up doing. Yeah, so that's in effect. The idea is that if this has a validity condition, this can't also have a validity condition. It's like mm -hmm. one or the other. Um, right, absolutely. OK, cool. So let's, let's, get our, uh, let's get our handy dandy parent lines. OK, cool. So this is going to end up be pretty easy. I'm not going to write the hashes up here, right? Because that's like sort of just like you know we, we assume that we're committing things. It's a Merkle tree, whatever, right? Um, so the base property is that you literally it, it's it's so simple, honestly. You take the leftmost um, thing in in each of the ranges. So here we're going to get zero. Here we're going to get ten. Here we're going to get fifty. Here we're going to get a hundred. Okay. So that is, our, um, that is our thing. And like notably, this was like an actual step that we just did here, where we took this transaction, which is also going to have like, you know, an ascender, recipient, Alice, Bob, blah, blah, blah. We turn that into just the hash of that thing, and we also pull out the start, right? So like each of these are really like we implicitly did a function here to turn these from transactions into hashes with an index. But we're just going to write the index because that's the important part. OK, um, so it's very simple. Parent function is equal to the hash of both of them, right? We're going to exclude the hash. And the left, coin ID. OK, so here, where you take the hash, it's the left, so it's 0. Here, we take the, ha the, you know, we take the hash, take the left, so it's 50, right? Uh, and here, we have the hash, it's, so it's 0, right? It's always going to end up being 0 at the top. OK, right. So what is the validity condition? So the validity condition uh, states that um, that this zero, uh, maybe, maybe I'll just like point it out and say it in words. It's like a little tricky to write. This zero uh, must be greater than or equal to this zero and this zero and this zero, right? Effectively, like the, the, the transactions range must be within the bound of this zero, right? The other property is that this 10 uh, must be less than or equal to um, this one. And it must also be less than or equal to this one. In fact, even more strictly, this 50 must be greater than this 10. So this 10 must be greater than or equal to this. This 50 must be greater than uh, this 10. And there's another condition, right? So if I, go, if I start from here, then this 50 must be greater or equal than this 10, right? Like, like you, need, you, need the, you need to check both sides. Ah, so notably, when you get this 50, you never actually see this 10. So let's, yeah, let, maybe this, was a, a simpler, this is a better case, actually. You're right. So let's look at this 50. When you download this Merkle branch, what do you get? You get this, uh, and you get this, mm -hmm. right? Uh, right? Um, and so, you know, it'll probably be useful to do like an size eight tree because this is, you know, there's not like a lot of things going on here. But it's a good simple example. So the property is actually that this 50 um, must be. Uh, so, 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 actually, what it is, you also get this one. And so the real property is that this uh, 50 uh, must be greater than or equal to this 50. Um, and this 100 must be less than or equal to this 100. I might be running ahead of the trend, right? But mm -hmm. let's say that this one was 55. Yep. And I, as a light client, it seems like I verified everything and everything checks, checks out. Yep. But there is actually an intersecting transaction, right? Yes. So, that's, so this is the beauty. OK, so, so th that's exactly right. What we want to do is try to break this thing. Right? Mm -hmm. OK, so what you're saying is a great way to break it. Like The way right. that you break things is you make intersecting ranges. Right. The trick is, though, 
that only really breaks it if both of the ranges pass the validity condition. So let's change this to 55, like you said, and let's do the check. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to erase these circles because we're going to get some new circles for this inclusion proof, and it's probably worth, probably worth circling them. Um, so hopefully that is bearably aesthetic. Right, OK, so we're going to do this one. Right, so, so, so what do we get? Uh, we get this one. This, yeah. We get this one, yeah. right? OK, so check it out. We get this, we get this zero, we see you know, blah, blah, blah. So the 10 is good, right? Because the 10 is greater than the zero. It's greater than the 10 here, right? Yes, yeah, so we also do get this one, actually. So the 10 is greater than here, uh, right? And then like, the, you know, this is a valid left index sum tree where this zero is in, you know, indeed goes up, right? Um, right, so the 10, the 10 checks out. However, the 55 does not check out. Why is that? The reason is because this 55 is greater than this 50. But as a light client, I, I only then load my transaction. I have no idea that this validity check doesn't check out. That's the beauty. Well, OK, well, restate your question, maybe. So as a light client, right? Yep. So let's say I'm a light client, and I receive this transaction. Yep. Right? So someone says, I'm sending you range from 50 to 100. Yep. And it's going to be in the Merkle tree. It's going to be at the position here. Mm -hmm. And so what I assume what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this position and then load it from like all the way from the past. Like for in every block, I will download this Merkle path, right, with indexes. Ah, so very but I will not download this one, right? Uh, so, so there's two things there. One of the things is that actually the, the leaf index changes every single block. Mm -hmm. So every single block, you download a different tr binary trace to a different index. So that's one, that's one thing. But it's going to be the same range every time? Um, well, you might have to download multiple indexes if the range was transacted. Oh, but, 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 uh, but I'm provided with the proofs for all of them. You're provided with the proofs, exactly. And so the, the operator gives you the proofs and he says, look, this is the range you want to see. But for the light client in this particular block, yes. let's say I'm receiving transactions from 50 to 100. Yep. What will be the proof? The proof? Oh, so for 50 to 100, yeah. So for 50 to 100, the proof will be what we circled before. It'll be this 50. So maybe I'll put that in square and we'll mm -hmm. do like circle square. So you'll get this, you'll get this. Um, you'll get this. But then as a light client, I get this proof I'm not aware that there's an intersecting transaction. Ah, and that is the beauty of it. You are not aware that there's an intersecting thing here, mm -hmm. and you don't care. Because you know, as soon as you see this number right here, you have a 100% guarantee that this 55 will fail the validity check. Oh, so only malicious actor could possibly Exactly. Control that. And even if a malicious actor does place a 55 here, the smart yeah, contract will yeah. reject it, right? And the reason for that rejection is because this 55 is invalid because it's greater than this 50, mm -hmm. right? And so, and so the fact that you have this 50 means that you know that anything greater than 50 here will, will break at that level. So mm -hmm. even though you've only downloaded this, even though you just downloaded this square branch, because this square branch like, gets you the 50, right? Because it does that, you have like a 100% guarantee that this horrible invalid stuff will be invalidated. And that, that is the light client property. Yeah, I'm completely sold. Nice. Yes. Um, should we go through, maybe we can go through a more complex example, like maybe an extra Yeah, yeah, I, th I, think, I think it makes sense to, 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 yeah, to, yeah, to yeah, show yeah. more okay, examples. Okay, yeah. okay. And, and then the other thing, so the other thing we'll do in this example um, is you'll note that, um, you'll note that this is a, like the range zero through a 500 was all transacted on this, um, like, was all transacted. There's no coins that weren't transacted. In practice, this isn't going to be the case, right? There's going to be big ranges of coins where the owner is, doesn't want to spend the coins, and so there's going to be gaps. And so the, the next example that we'll look at, we'll increase the height of this tree. We'll double the height, um, or increment the height, um, and we will make some gaps. And then that, maybe that will be pretty informative. Cool. Yeah. And, and to prove that something does not exist, you provide, like, two two paths, uh, or, like you so actually, or you actually have an empty game. Very interestingly, we'll even show that it can be just one. It's very, very, it's very, very interesting, and it's even shared between all of the adjacent ranges that also aren't transacted. So we'll, we'll do that. We'll do that. Okay, so let's do a simple example. Let's do um, 0, 10. Okay, am I, maybe I'm going to start, I'm going to start down a little lower and bigger so I don't kick myself in the foot here. Okay, so let's go here. We'll say 0, 10. Okay, now we'll go here, we'll say, um, let's make a gap. So we'll say 20, 30. Okay, am I spacing this out right? Three, four, five. Okay, I need to do this smaller, honestly, don't I? So I'm just gonna do that. Okay, so let's go 20, 30. Um, let's do, um, you know, whatever. I mean, this can be, you know, literally whatever we want. So 50, 100, right? Um, let's make it, um, 
thousand, two thousand. Maybe maybe I'm going to regret having to write a bunch of extra zeros up there, but oh well. Um, Something invalid maybe. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. So why don't we do um, why don't we do um, seventy five? Seventy five yeah. to yeah, seventy five to one hundred. So, so the idea with the single range is that you actually, the, the, like, like if, if, I, if I give this range, then somewhere along the way, I will get 50 as the left, right? Exactly right. So I will know that this, yeah. Exactly right, exactly right. Yes, it's, yes, it's absolutely. Okay, so we've only drawn eight transactions here, so it's not a full tree, um, but maybe I will do one more. So we have this invalid 7500 here, and then I'll maybe give that a sibling, and we'll call this, like, um, you know, back to an, a valid thing. So we'll call it, like, you know, 2000. 3,000. Okay, so technically there's going to be some extras here. We're just going to draw like a truncated version, sort of ignore the subtree. Okay, so let's do that. Whoop. Um, here we go. All right, how are my Merkle tree skills? We're doing okay. We're doing okay. Of course, this is going to have a like that we haven't seen, but imagine it's there. It's not going to matter for our examples. Uh, and then, of course, we have the root. Okay. Um, how does this look? Does this look fine? Yes. Yes, we have drawn a Merkle tree. Wonderful. Well, we've drawn a binary tree, I suppose. Okay, so why don't we consider um, some, of these, some of these gaps over here? So maybe we'll choose, I um, think this guy's a good guided inclusion proof for? Mm -hmm. Not. Sounds good. Sounds good. Or actually, let's construct the whole part of the subtree that we have here. Let's do that. Okay, so again, zero to, 100, zero to 10, we take the left, zero. 20 to 30, 20. And, and, and quick, quick question. So, so if Let's say that um, that malicious operator created a, they just populated one of the left, uh, of one of the, how do we call them, coin IDs incorrectly. Then, then, then there's a, some sort of a challenge that will show that this is the case. Um, so, say it again, say it again. So, so imagine that I'm a malicious operator. Mm -hmm. I'm coll colluding, actually, on this example, right? Yep. Uh, as I compute the Merkle root, yep. the, the, Mer the Merkle tree, I will just say that the coin ID here is 2000, which is incorrect. Which is a lie. Yep. Which is a lie, but, yep. I, but I will compute the proof all the way up, right? So it's also going to be 2000 here. Yep. And then for someone over here, I will say, oh, you know what? Your proof is, your proof is this node, right? Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I guess, this node. This node, right. And this is this node. And this node. And this one says, says it's 2000. Yep. And, and then you, as a... As a light client, you say, perfect, my, uh, my, uh, my transaction is correct, yeah. right? So I presume there's got to be some challenge, right? That's the trick. Well, that, that's, that's the beauty of it. Because this says 2000, you are guaranteed. Because when, this, this, person because when, this, because when this person tries to exit, right, they'll, 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 they'll try to submit that proof to the smart contract, and the smart contract will go, okay, 75, sure, 2000, sure. Now we want the left node. They won't get a 75, mm -hmm. they won't, the 75 here is 2000, they'll go, eh, it's not going to work. So it's, it's an invalidity, it's a validity condition. And in, in practice, like where it is in our code right now, for example, is um, what, what is going to happen is the root hash is not going to be the same root hash that you end up with as the root hash of the, um, as root hash that was submitted, right? Because the smart contracts, as it's simulating the, the, the inclusion proof, is going to put a 75 here. And because the 2000 was put here, the entire root hash is going to be wrong. And so it won't be used. And so that's the beauty of it. As soon as this guy sees this 2000, he knows that even if this range does intersect this stuff, it's going to be invalidated. It's mm -hmm. not going to be OK. And so he doesn't care what's there. The operator can screw up other portions of the coin, but he knows his is good awesome. of the coin range. Yep. OK. Yeah, so maybe we'll just finish this tree. So we've got a 0, 50, 0, 0. It's always 0 at the top. 2000, 2000. Yeah, so this is an interesting case here where like we sort of did the wrong example, right, for this thing. Um, um, I think we've actually gone over this example pretty well, so I'll leave this as invalid here. Are you so let's say this is 75 now, yeah. Okay, okay, we can do that. Okay, but like very notably, right now, what we have is a very broken tree. Um, so for this tree, uh, only these two transactions check out, right? It's very interesting. Oh, this one checks out. Um, oh, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're totally right. Yeah. So particularly the coins like in the range like um, 50 to 75 are sort of like these proofs. They're like, ah, I don't know what to do with this. It's sort of invalid, right? Um, and that's like going to be a problem um, for them. 100%. Um, yeah. But, 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 but you're, you're, you're totally right. Um, this, guy, this guy will be totally pleased and these guys may be pleased as well. Yep. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so what do we want to do with this? Okay, so maybe we can walk through like a simple check. So let's walk, let's walk through the check of this guy and show that it's right, and then we'll walk through the checks of these guys and show that this screwed things up. Okay, so let's, let's, do, let's do this check. So let's call this, um, let's do a triangle, okay? Um, and so what is this inclusion proof get? This gets this guy, gets this guy, gets this guy, uh, and that's it, right? The wonders of logs. <laughs> so, um, okay, so this guy, he gets this, this, and this. So what are the checks he needs to perform? The one check they need to perform is that for the left guy, he, the, 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 his, his start of his transaction, right, is like, is like greater, you know, is greater than or equal to all of like the, the indices going up. So, oh, and, and actually, he also gets this one as well. It, it is required to give the thing that this is parsed to. Um, well, I take it back. Actually, it can be, it can be implicitly inferred. Okay. Um, yeah, you don't, yeah, it just it calculates it from the 20 right there. Okay. So the 20... He looks here. He goes, okay, great. Is my, is, my, um, is my zero less than my 20? Yes. Okay, we're good. Sweet. Does this check out to the left thing? Yes, we're good. Okay. Now he goes to this level. He goes, okay, is my 30 uh, less than or equal to my 50? He goes, yes. Oh my gosh, great. It is. So we can go here. Is this zero the same as the zero here? Yes, it is. Does the hash check out? Obviously, too. Now he gets this guy. He goes, okay, we've got a 75. So for the 75, he needs to be sure that this 75 is greater than this previous 50. So he goes, okay, 75 is greater than the 50. Oh my gosh, we're almost there. 75 and zero, does it go to zero? Yes, we're good. Okay, so the triangle transaction in this tree that we've, that we've constructed, the triangle is like totally happy. He's a happy cat, can keep on transacting, do whatever you want, right. But of course, we did insert this sneaky little guy here, um, so we're gonna see how it breaks. Okay, so let's watch how it breaks. Okay, so let's do um, maybe a square for the 50 to 100. Note that this is going to be the one that really, really breaks because there's a 75 to 100 there, right, as well. Okay, so what does the square get? The square gets this guy, uh, he gets this guy, and this guy as well, right? So very, 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 quite similar, quite similar. Okay, so what does he do? So he says, okay, I've got 50 to 100. What it, did my 50 turn into a 50? Yes, we're good. Did this 50 turn into this 50? Yes, we're good. 50 is, you know, less than or equal to 50, so we're okay. Now he goes to his 100. He goes, okay, I got this guy. Is my 100 um, greater than or equal, to, less than or equal to my 1,000? Yes, oh my gosh, it is, wonderful. Okay, so we go up here. He goes, okay, we got the zero here. Um, is the zero less than the 50? Yes. Is the zero the one propagated up? Yes, okay, great. Now he gets this one. He goes, okay, is our 75 greater than or equal to our 1,000? And he goes, oh no, we're not. So we see here that this is like the breaking point for this inclusion proof because of this overlap, right? That, that is what ends up happening. So like, we have, because um, 75 is not greater than um, 1,000, because that's not true, then this would be an invalid block. And it's an invalid block, and this person must stop signing transactions and exit their it, money. It, it's not greater or equal, right? Um, because it would have been uh, it can be equal, it can be, it can be equal, actually. Yeah, it can be greater than equal. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Um, Right, okay, so this is a simple example of how it broke, right? And of course, if we were to like invert our heads and imagine again, like we did in the beginning, that this 75 was like the invalid thing and this was the 2000, and this was 2000, then it would be good because we would have 2000 is greater than or equal to 1000. That was the example I had before. And we would know that that invalidates this, all types of these things, so we're good. Okay, so that is maybe a more complex, like eight, you know, you know eight, 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 um, eight transaction tree. That makes sense. Yeah, this is yeah. I'm completely sold. Yes, it's it's wonderful. Okay, so let's talk about cool properties of this. Um, oh yeah, because we were going to talk about the gaps, and this is this is very important, mm -hmm. right? So oh yeah. Let's, let, say, let, let's say that we need to prove that 10 to 20 is a gap. Exactly. Exactly. Or even yeah. better, 30 to 50, I guess. Yeah. Let's do let's do 30 to 50. 50. So let's say that I own range um, 30 through 50, um, and I want to um, be ensured that my money was not spent. Um, what do I need for that? Believe it or not, it is just one branch. And that is really, really, really awesome. So as a matter of fact, this triangle branch both is what we call a, a non-inclusion proof for coins 30 to 50, just as much as is an inclusion proof for coins 20 to 30. Okay, so let's, let's think about that, why that is. Okay, so when we get the triangle thing, right, what do we get? We get this guy, we get this guy, and we get this guy, right? Um, 
Right. And maybe should we change this back to 2000 for now? Uh, I, I think, yeah, sure. Oh, no, 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 because it's okay for him. It's okay for him. Yeah, it will work. Yeah, you're right. Okay, yeah, wonderful. So, okay. So let's say I, I, I didn't transact coins 30 through 50, right? What do I see from this? Well, the really, the only thing that I care about is I see that this, that this um, 30 is like, you know, less than or equal to my 30 that I, you know, that I own, right? So like, because this transaction ends at 30, I know that this transaction can only talk about 20 through 30, right? So we're, so, we're, so we're good on what this guy can do, right? And then we see, obviously, the zero and the zero and the zero. It's like a valid branch. Like, that's obviously important. Um, and the other thing we see is we see this 50 right here. And the cool thing about this 50 is we know, because of this 50, that the start of this transaction must be 50, right? And it cannot be less than 50 is really the key property there. It cannot be less than 50. So therefore, simply by getting this triangle, the same inclusion proof for the 20 to 30 spend, this single inclusion proof is both a spend of 20 to 30 and it is a non -inclu and it is a n unspent proof, a proof that the coins weren't committed to being spent on the range 30 through 50 here, right? So like, it's like both an X here and like a check here, right? Mm -hmm. And it is the same exact sort of triangle proof that supplies you both. Interesting. Um, so, th so that makes sense, yeah? Yeah. yeah? Seems reasonable. Okay, so what is like one really cool thing about that? One really cool thing about that is, you know, this is like a very simple example, but imagine this, this, this was a 30 and this was a 2 million, right? Even with that, it's just one inclusion proof. And let's say, you know, let's say there were like 1,000 owners between 30 and 2 million and none of them transacted. All of them share the same single non-inclusion proof that is just this triangle transaction. And so what that means is you actually have like history overlaps, which is really cool. So in Plasma Cash, normally, like every coin had a unique history that was at a unique branch. In this version, anytime a coin is unspent, if its neighbor is unspent, both of them download each other's inclusion proofs, right? So you can argue that there's like dangers for that with regard to privacy, like maybe that's a little less private, um, but you can actually like, you can split it up and have like a transaction that says like 100 to 100, like it has no, it has, it's like empty, and that would be fine as well. Um, so it's, really, it's a really, really interesting property that you actually have like shared sort of non-inclusion proofs for adjacent coins that weren't transacted. Cool. So I think my, the most interesting question that I have right now is, so let's say I'm, I'm a merchant, yep. I'm a coffee shop, yep. and I sell a lot of coffee during the day. Yep. So during the day I got a lot of, uh, and let's say the lowest denomination is $5, and it happens to be exactly the price of a latte. Yep. Um, and so I got a lot of them. How do I defragment? How do, uh, I, how do I bring all of them right. together to, to send all of them to my cold storage? So, so, I, will, so I, will, I will push back on one thing you just said, which is let's say the lowest denomination is five. So in this model, even these, this 50 to 100 is way smaller numbers than we deal with in practice. So like we actually encode, like encode way into our, into our coin IDs because literally like the size of like the, the, what these numbers are define the size, not like the amount of transactions or anything. Mm -hmm. So in reality, like the, all of these constructions allow you to do like, you know, many, like a millionth of a cent, pretty much at the same price as if the minimum denomination was five. Mm -hmm. Anyway, your point is still totally valid, right? So the question is, um, so how, maybe there's like a good way to visualize this. Okay, so like the way that I sort of visualize the plasma cash flow construction is I imagine like a number line uh, and I imagine different colors on different s segments of that number line. And color is the owner. And the color is the owner, exactly, yeah. So we might have like a, you know, like a, like a dark purple section here and then a light section here and then like a diag you know, a diagonal thing. Obviously we don't have a lot of color colors, so this is like the best we can do, right? But right, you might have something like this, right? And so absolutely the 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 the, the, the thing that you need to solve in this in, in this scheme is even though we've we've broken down the denominations, the coins are not adjacent. Right? And that means that they need to be exited separately and that's bad. So like imagine that this guy um, so imagine the coffee um, the co let's say the, the coffee shop owner is like a squiggly, a squiggly, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine that like this is block N and like at N plus one, like a bunch of people buy coffee, right? So now, so now like this guy bought some squiggly coffee here and the rest is still his, right? And this guy bought some squiggly coffee here, but the rest is still his. It's like his mm -hmm. change, right? Almost, right? Um, the next guy bought the squiggly coffee here. Oh God, well, I kind of did squiggle spice here. We'll cross hatch, there we go. And then, um, and then this guy still has his leftovers here, right? And similarly, this guy did a bit here. 
sauce so is left over there, right? So the problem is that now the coffee owner, the squiggly guy, owns this, owns this, whoops, owns this, and owns this, right? Um, the problem is that this, so, so the, the, there's a few things to note about this. Um, in theory, there's something called like a mass exit, or like, like the, like, how do I want to say this? Okay, so like in theory, what we need to do at the smart contract level is support effectively like arbitrary um, compression algorithms on the ranges of coins that you're exiting. Mm -hmm. So like we have a very simple compression algorithm in effect on our, um, on, in our current exit game, which is start and end, right? You know, when you exit coins 50 to 100, right, in Plasma Cash, what you do is you say, I'm exiting coin 50, I'm exiting coin 51, I'm exiting coin 52, I'm exiting coin 53, right? And so we technically, like, our exits are like a compression of that, right? Which is very, very simple. It's just the start and the end, right? So very, very, like, basic, like, compression, utilizing the structure of these coin IDs as all being adjacent. Um, so one thing that we want, might want to do is, like, provide the coffee store um, owner the ability to begin an exit uh, in which they sort of describe these intervals in like a compressed useful way. So like the simplest way might be um, that the coffee owner says, well, my coffees are all $5. So I'm exiting a bunch of coffee payments and they're each $5 long. So instead of giving you the start and the end, I'm just going to give you the start, right? And so then they just give this start and this start and this start uh, and this start, right? And bada bing, bada boom, they've, they've, they've cut it in half because it's just starts mm -hmm. and one length instead of start and start and start and start and. So like already that's an improvement, right? And in general, what we're talking about here is like compression, right? And there's like massive amounts of, um, you know, like it's lossless compression specifically, right? But for the exit, can I just say, I want to exit all my coins from here up to here. Yeah. So then transaction is very small. Yeah. I mean, it's still like the, the operator will have to record each of them. But my exit transaction is tiny now. In, in what I've just described. Oh no, I'm, I'm suggesting so, so in your in, in what you described, you effectively reducing the size by a factor of two, right? Correct. Yeah. Well, I'm saying, what if I just because for each of those um, tokens, right, the owner is known, like the public key of the owner is known, right? Uh, that is true um, for uh, like for like people with availability on the plasma chain. Mm -hmm. From the cart smart contract's perspective, the smart contract has no idea. So when right. you, whenever you submit an exit to the smart contract, it, you need to specify this is the exact set of coins that are owned right now, and like you need to accept challenges if they disprove that this is the coins that are owned by whom, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just as simple as saying, I'm gonna exit all the coins that are owned by me. Right. Smart contract needs to know how many coins those are, and, and very importantly, which coins they are, like very, very mm -hmm. critically. Okay, so I've just described one weird like sort of compression-y thing, and like, you know, to the extent that we can do on-chain compression, like, we're going to strive to have things like that. And this is like a general class of what, what has been previously called like mass exits. You can do all sort of fun stuff here. You can like do true bits over these numbers. You can like submit a Merkle root of this and have someone challenge you to reveal the Merkle root and do lots of optimistic fun stuff. Um, but the core of it is that it would be much better is if we could just get all these things mixed up so that it is one contiguous range. Like, like, like even if we have better compression, we want to make the data like as compressible as possible. And big, long, continuous ranges are like very, very compressible. Okay. So the way to solve this, we've considered a few different ways. Um, there's like two classes of it, but what we're calling it is defragmentation, right? We want to take all these squiggles, right? Mm -hmm. Take all these squiggles and make them one big long squiggle, right? And then we want to like shift all this, you know, this dark section and this skinny section and these cross hashes and these dots. We want to shift them all so that they're all pressed up against each other as well. Okay. Um, so we're calling that defragmentation. And like, um, there's like several ETH research posts on this um, for all listeners. ETH, ethresearch.ch. ETH research is an awesome forum. You guys should all check out. Uh, Vitalik has some defragmentation posts on there. Um, but the one that seems most uh, promising is atomic swaps. So basically the idea, like w without rewriting another example, which I will do in a second, basically the idea out loud though, is simply have this guy swap his dark section over to here and move this squealy section over here. So it's like I'm exchanging coin one with your coin five. And even though the coins are both worth the same amount, so it's not like we're actually transacting in terms of value, we are transacting the like exitability because they're non-fungible in terms of their history. So like maybe we'll do a much simpler example here, right? So imagine um, that this coin range is owned by Alice, and then this coin range is owned by Bob, right? And then this coin range is owned by Alice, 
right? And then this coin range is owned by Bob, right? Should be very clear what we want to do here. What we want to do is switch these two guys back, mm -hmm. right? So instead, what we want to end up with is like, at, you know, this is at height n, and then at height n plus 1, we want to have suddenly this, right? Right? And so what, it, what, what has been done here, it's an atomic swap on these two things, right? And we want to ensure, for Alice and Bob's sake, well, obviously, you know, if we're assuming these are all equal quarters, then they should all be aligned, right? Um, the, the thing that we want to ensure is for both Alice and Bob that they are like safe in the event that, that, that this happens. In other words, Bob can't so, somehow be tricked to sending these coins to Alice um, without receiving Alice's coins, right? Okay, and one very important thing here, and this is like, um, this is in general, I think something that people very much struggle with intuitively in like the cash flow interpretation. Because we think of these ranges as like, we think of like the things in the Merkle tree or like the transactions as being coins, really they are like updates to the underlying coins. So when I draw these arrow here, arrows here, I actually think that this is maybe a little misleading because it almost looks like you're taking these coins and you're swapping places with them. So actually, I think that's probably a bad way to draw it and probably is like badly reinforcing. What you're really doing is you're keeping these coins like here, like they're the same coins, but you're swapping the owners. Mm -hmm. You're swapping the owners. So that's really what you want to do. You want to take, um, you know, you want to take continuous ranges and, and maximize the like continuous rangeness of each owner. Um, and so you need atomic swaps to enable that. Um, it's pretty easy to do an atomic swap. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's non-trivial, but it's relatively easy to do an atomic swap. Basically, like to atomic swap this range with this range, you need inclusion proofs on both. Um, and like, if both inclusion proofs are present, that's good. So now instead of just checking the triangle, like the transaction says, you got to check the triangle and the square for this guy, and you check both the triangle and the square, and they swap. Um, so our smart contracts, for example, currently support this, fun this atomic swap functionality. But like the strategies as to how we're going to convince people to do this because people have to be online and like sign off to agree to do it. In this case, like we think it's incentive compatible because both Alice and Bob like are helped by this, right? Like their exits go down. But, but uh, the, the coffee shop example is more interesting. I'm actually not sure if the coffee shop example is much harder. Yeah, the white but that, that. Oh, okay. But like if we if we repl replicate it here, right? So this is my coffee shop. Yeah. It is definitely seen. So that's the, the coffee shop owner is the rectangles, and that's like one guy. Yep. And this is my the coffee shop owner, some other guy, and the coffee shop owner, and some third guy. Yeah. Uh, so here, uh, the first. So so let's assume that people are willing to to help, even if it doesn't benefit them much. Yep. Yep. So here, the first guy will say, "Yeah, you know, I, I'm going to I'm willing to help you and exchange and like obviously five dollars." Yeah, maybe he gets a you know a, a coffee coupon. Yeah. <laughs> so, so so yeah. So that, that, those guys are willing to help. Yeah. Um, and so what happens after he helps me is that uh, he continues here. And my and, and, and I have yep, a contiguous exactly. range, or, exactly. or even that would have been a bad idea for, on my end. Actually, for me, it would have been better to have him here and myself here, because that helps me to convince this guy to exchange exactly. with me. Because for him, exactly. it's still no hassle. Exactly. But then I'm sort of in in trouble because, uh, like 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 for this person, it's not beneficial to exchange with me because right. they will get. Yeah, and so these problems are tough. And in general, it like we, like we can hypothesize a lot about like what like these defragmentation like structures may look like. So like one 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 observation that we've made, for example, is that it's probably going to be a role of the operator to suggest these to clients. Mm -hmm. So like what we want is we'll we'll abstract all that away. Like we don't actually when you're buying coffee, you don't have to agree with the coffee. You know, I, I joked that you get a coffee coupon, but in reality, you don't want ever to be buying a coffee and then like the coffee shop is like, by the way, can you like switch those around? So you know, like. But, but can can, that's I, not good, can right? operator enforce changes? What's that? Can can the operator enforce changes? So it's it's the operator can enforce. So it, it's tricky. So the um, for the people checking this out on ETH Research. We have a plasma cache uh, defragmentation take two. There's three defrag posts. Vitalik's second one talks about this. Um, and it's very tricky. You can't allow the operator to enforce this off chain. So if you indeed do the swap, uh, it must be the case that all of that swap data is put on the main chain. So it doesn't have very good scalability. But if you don't, the operator can swap you and like withhold that he's swapping you. And he can exit the things that he swapped you to. Mm -hmm. And like you don't have a way to challenge it, and then he like, and then he like you know exits the things that he swapped you from, and he can like steal you know like he it's effectively like 
you know, imagine that Bob is the operator and the operator exits this and then exits this, right? And like takes like what, you know, both, of, both this total range when only half of it was owned by him. Yeah. So to prevent that, you have to put this, like the ranges being swapped have to be available on the main chain, which is kind of bad. Um, there's maybe more complex things you do. You can like define like an on-chain permutation and like compress that permutation or something, right? But in general, it seems like atomic swaps are the way to go. Um, because one of the things that we'll probably have here is probably in reality, there's gonna be times when there's just a big long range of coins that is like a whale, you know, on like this DEX or whatever. And like it's gonna be an extra like source of like like fee revenue if they use their liquidity to help a bunch of people just totally like migrate atomic swap into them, right? You know, and just like totally move everything over. Um, but it's definitely an active area of research um, and like one that like is gonna be explored more in the future for sure. Cool. Okay, I think we covered quite a bit of material. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Uh, and so let's wrap up in here. And I think one thing would be good to, to, to know is where can people find implementations of that or yeah, like where to sure. go for research and stuff? Sure, absolutely. Um, so if you go to plasma.group, um, we have all the info you need. Um, so the state of the implementation is as follows. Um, we have a spec, we have a smart contract written in Viper. Um, we have a node, a, um, an operator, and like helper libraries, like a, kind of like an SDK, um, all written in JavaScript. So github.com slash plasma-group or go to plasma.group and we'll link to all that stuff. Um, and we would absolutely love that. Like we're absolutely trying to build a community of developers. This is like we're a nonprofit organization. Like it's just our goal to help promote this stuff as free public good stuff. Um, yeah, so that's fantastic. If you want to just try it out, you know, I mean, it's like an NPM install for both running up your own, spinning up your own operator, which feels really cool to be making these trees on your laptop, right? That's really fun. Is there a visualization? There is a block explorer. There is a block explorer. Yep, it's not as cool. I wish we had the visualization of like just this. It's just kind of lists of transactions. My end goal is we're going to have amazing, colorful rainbows of ranges and all that, right? But for now, there is a block explorer up. Um, if you just want to like try it out and transact and like learn about depositing stuff, you can also go to burner.plasma group, and we've integrated um, like the amazing Austin Griffiths burner wallet um, for XDI right on Plasma. Um, so those are all things you can try, and we like super encourage you to check that out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot for coming. Yeah. Thanks, guys. <clears throat>